a good day then. Good. Are you guys excited about tomorrow? Yeah. Yay, I know. Me too. Have you guys had a chance at all to do any photos or play around with the shawls and come up with some designs? We haven't we haven't gotten to the designs yet. We were kind of waiting for today. Okay. But, all right. Um, Good. Okay. Well, I wanted to first introduce you guys to Christian. Um, Christian is going to be doing today's presentation, and um, he'll be talking about the Paisley with you guys, the evolution, the the background of it. But he's also going to talk about a particular watercolor painting that is at the Hillwood Museum as well. So when you guys are at Hillwood, that will help you also look at the work that you're going to be studying to kind of how do you look at a painting and determine what. So he'll go over how to do that as well. And please feel free to ask questions as he's going along. Christian, how about you start out with a quick background about yourself um, and just your art history background and your interest as an artist with what we're doing with Cashmere Rose. Hi, uh, my name is Christian Ruth. I'm a history student at the University of Kentucky. Um, I also do art history a bit. And um, I'm working with Cashmere Rose and Aaliyah. And um, so today I'll, I'll, I'll keep it brief, don't worry. I know you're probably not incredibly interested, don't worry. Um, a history of this painting that we're going to show you, but also the Paisley pattern, because Paisley is a major part, a major pattern of uh, Cashmere shawls. Um, so that's what we'll be going over today. And if you want to go ahead and click the next slide. Great. Uh, so this is a painting from the Hill Collection. It's Countess Moose and Fushin. She's Russian, hence the strange name. Um, and as you can see, she's wearing what is then 1820s, 1830s, uh, very stereotypical like Russian fashion. Um, but if you notice, this yellow shawl, this yellow cloth she's wearing, is like a cashmere shawl. And you can see on it the uh, blue like pattern. Uh, which is the Paisley pattern. Um, and this was then in Russia, but also all throughout Europe, a really, 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 really popular pattern because it was exotic and strange and it's kind of new. So it was the height of fashion then. Um, and if you do also notice, there are two main colors in the painting and two bright colors. What are those? If you can like shout and I can hear you. That's a question of the girls. What what two colors stand out to your eyes in this painting? I kind of heard yellow. I also kind of heard blue. Yeah. You said yellow and blue. You are correct. It is <laughs> yellow and blue. Um, so yellow and blue are in like art history, um, two particularly important important colors because pigments made for paints um, weren't made like they are today back then. They were made through mostly minerals. And the like this yellow, uh, this like a deep yellow that Aaliyah pulled up um, is called cadmium yellow. Um, and cadmium yellow is of course made from the mineral cadmium. That's the name. Um, and cadmium is a fairly common mineral. Um, and it's on your left. It's the shiny, silvery looking thing, uh, which is in and of itself pretty useless, but when you expose it to acid and do chemical things with it, you get this lovely, lovely yellow color, which is cadmium sulfide. And I won't bore you with the chemistry of it, but cadmium yellow, once you heat it up, turns into a powder, which you can make into paint. Uh, and that cadmium yellow is extremely popular and very, very, very common throughout art history. Um, so that was the color, that yellow is the color used in the painting. And girls, do you uh, remember the uh, photo sh photos that Mara was showing you? And one of the ones we were talking about was the pigments. Do you remember the powdered pigments that we saw a photo of yesterday? What do we say that was used for? Do you remember?
How do they get the color yellow with these shawls? What do they have to do? Yay! <laughs> exactly. <laughs> dye it. So before they can dye it, they actually have to create the color. And that's why chemistry was so important to artists in the earlier times is because they created their own colors. They didn't have these shops where you just go to the store and you just go ahead and buy any color paint you want. They would actually play around with minerals and um, different components and oils and things to create their own um, different uh, colors of paint and or dyes as well. So in actuality, artists in the 1718 Renaissance even era were also scientists and chemists um, as well. So that's why the whole concept of STEM education, it's not necessarily a new thing because if you go back in history, you learn that the artists were really these engineers coming up with these great ideas, uh, revolutionizing stuff as well. So that's why this plays an important role in not just fashion, because somebody has to create it as well. Do you guys have any questions on the process of the colors that they would create and how um, they would dye it into the shawls and then ultimately convert it into different designs as well? Like the pattern itself, it's not all yellow, right? The shawl's yellow. Well, how do we say that they pro probably got the other um, paisley designs in the shawl? Yeah, that's a good question. I always wonder about that. Did, was your question how long did the design concept? The dyeing process. Oh, dyeing process. It really varies actually on the color that you're dyeing. And once again, um, it's also going to depend on the temperature you're going to dye the colors at as well. So, for example, like this here is purely just taking acid and putting it into what's the other? Um, it's just sulfur. Is that all it was, Christian? Sulfide? Yeah. To get the yellow. Um, so you could see that they already have that yellow, but now to get that yellow into a particular material, it depends on what that material is. It depends on the water temperature that they're going to have to put that into and then how long they would possibly have to boil it in that water if that's one of the things they would be doing. So each color is actually going to have its own um, time frame of dyeing as well as perhaps some of the mixtures that they're going to include in it as well. Yep, this is exactly right. Um, if you want, we can go on to the ultramarine. The next slide. So, uh, the other color in the painting uh, was blue, very, very vivid blue, and that color is called ultramarine uh, in terms of like art pigments. So ultramarine was, and still is, a very, very commonly used color. However, back then, it was incredibly hard to get because it was extremely expensive. Um, the name itself, ultramarine, means beyond the sea. It's a very romantic origin. Um, but it's derived from the lapis lazuli stone, which you'll see on the screen right here. And um, lapis lazuli back then was only really found in one area of Afghanistan, a very like remote mountainous region. So it was hard to get, really, really, really hard to get. And Argus considered it more precious than gold because it was so rare. But it was so needed because it makes this very, very vivid and beautiful blue, which you need for paintings. Um, and actually, it was so hard to get that in 1824, the French Science like Society had a contest to see if two, if see if any of their chemists or scientists could make a like fake synthetic version of ultramarine, so it would be much more easier to produce. And eventually they did. And nowadays, 
the color that we know as ultramarine is also called French ultramarine because the French chemists won the contest. Um, if you powder down, if you like pound down lapis lazuli into a powder, you can you will then use it into the pigment, like the old style pigment. So old ultramarine was literally like powdered rare stones made into paint. So not only was it beautiful, it was literally made with like gemstones, um, which made it rare and expensive and quite hard to attain. So there are some paintings, like very famous paintings, by people like Michelangelo, who didn't finish his painting. Like he couldn't afford the color ultramarine. So he had paintings that either had to not use blue or he simply didn't finish because he couldn't afford it. So it was really common. It's really cool. Um, girls, do you have any questions on the ultramarine blue or lapis lazuli itself? Do you think it's mined anywhere else other than Afghanistan now in the current time? Okay, can you guess where else lapis lazuli besides Afghanistan could be mined today? Anybody? Pick a country or a continent even. Think of mountains. Yeah, regions where they are very mountainous. But also cooler in temperature perhaps. Um, Christian, would that be correct? Yeah. So can you think of a place that they might also find lapis now? Full of cold mountains. I can't really hear them clearly. Um, can you say what the, the which? I'm sorry, I can't. I really can't hear you. Himalayas. Himalayas. Okay. Um. Yeah. So Tibet and Kashmir and the um Afghanistan region definitely they still mine it, but I don't think it's the primary location anymore that Lapis comes from Christian what are some of the other areas that um, they now are mining Lafayette? So Afghanistan and Pakistan are still pretty major sources but also Russia, um, the Andes Mountains in Chile as well as Italy, Mongolia and even the US and Canada so it's found in just cold really dry mountain regions. Wow and where in the US is it mined? Um, I think near the Rocky Mountains. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. Any questions, girls, on the lapis or the color itself? No. Okay, I can hear that. That's pretty good. Sounds like a song. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's talk about the um, paisley real quick. Um. So. Paisley is a pattern that goes back way, 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 way back in history. Um, originally, it was used in areas of like Persia and Kashmir, so over in Pakistan, um, but it originated in Persia. So if you think of the modern country of Iran, that's where it started. Um, and it became famous in Europe after Europeans went over into India and Southeast Asia and brought back shawls and clothing with the paisley pattern, or what would become the paisley pattern. Uh, so these shawls were weaved from like goats, goats fleece and silk, uh, and were made popular first in England during the late 18th century, and they were actually mostly worn by men in the first place. Um, British people, like Britain itself, started to try to imitate these paisley patterns, and the, the origin of the word paisley, like what we call paisley, the pattern, is actually because there was a Scottish town in Scotland called Paisley, and they set up a lot of clothing shops there, and that's where they started making, in Britain, 
these shawls with the pattern. So in Britain and in other places, it's called paisley, that kind of pattern. Uh, but it depends on where you are, because you know the British were the first ones to start it in Europe. The French were the ones who really, really, really embraced the pattern of paisley, and they set the style for the rest of Europe. So Napoleon, the big conquering emperor Napoleon, uh, loved like loved the pattern. He bought dozens of cashmere shawls from Egypt for his wife Josephine, and she wore them and made them very popular. And cashmere shawls, that paisley pattern, started to be created also in France. And what made paisley so popular in Europe was that it was very easy to make after a certain point because there was a French inventor, Joseph Marie Jacquard, who made a loom, which is the machine with which you make clothing, uh, which made it much, much easier, a special type of loom, to make these kinds of clothes. And this loom, this is the Jacquard loom, spread throughout Europe. And by 1836, they started to be used also in Paisley, Scotland. Like they, they went all over Europe. Um, and because they were still considered exotic, because they originated from way off in Afghanistan and Pakistan and India, um, it became very, very popular and the, the height of fashion. So even though it was a European style, like America, like early Americans, like you know George Washington, that kind of thing, um, loved the paisley pattern. And in early America, paisley was the height of fashion. And weirdly enough, even though it started out hundreds of years ago, paisley has seen like a, a comeback. So in the 60s, with um, like the height of the hippies and that kind of thing, um, in the 70s, you had artists like the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, or Jimi Hendrix. They started to use Paisley because they found it, they thought it was neat, and uh, they made it popular again in America in the 60s. And it lasted to the 80s, and even to today, Paisley is extremely popular. Uh, so after a brief lull, you know, it went away for a while, Paisley has come back. And that's the history of Paisley. Which is kind of really cool, uh, but now we, we, we've we talked about Paisley being in Europe, but it wasn't just in Europe. Russia was also a big um, importer of products from the Kashmir region as well, so a lot of their um, patterns, some of them, the shawls especially that came from Kashmir obviously had the Paisley in it, but if you look at their embroidery work, you'll notice that in, in their clothing as well. I'm actually going to now show you guys this painting here, which is called the Boyer Wedding Feast, and this is the main exhibit that Hillwood has on display right now, focusing on this particular painting. Um, and if you look at the painting very closely, you're going to notice something interesting about the shawls that are being worn. I want you guys to take a closer look at these guys over here. What do you see them? What, what do you see wrapped around them? Can you see? Can you see the painting? If you if you look closely at this painting, and you're going to get a much better view of it tomorrow. What you're going to see is, you see this guy right here? So these are all pretty much elite noble individuals from um, 1600s Russia, it, but this painting was actually painted in the late 1800s as a depiction of what a Boyer wedding feast would look like. So some of the things could be possibly off historically because the painting was actually done 200 years after what the artist was trying to create. But if you look at the men, um, you notice that they're wearing these shawls. They're wearing the shawls around their beautiful costumes as well, um, but also around their waist as a belt. And even the bride herself has a scarf shawl in her hand as well as of course she's wearing it um, and then you see the women over here wearing the scarves or shawls around their headdresses as well so 
according to the oldest documentation that I've actually found, um, the first de depiction of a cashmere shawl was actually done in the Mona Lisa. So um, when you guys get a chance to look at the Mona Lisa, you'll notice that she has this really thin gold band or over her head. And then there's this really thin layer of a scarf that goes behind her. But that was the first kind of introduction of the cashmere uh, shawls introduced into the European world where women would integrate it into their clothing, whereas primarily it was the men that wore the shawls initially. But this is such a beautiful, beautiful painting, and you're going to have a chance to see it. Um, one of uh, one of the teams will actually be, be um, doing their research on the shawls that the men are wearing, um, and then we'll have another team that's going to focus on one of the dresses that they have um, in at the Hillwood, where you can see the paisley pattern on it, but it's a Russian dress. So you're going to actually do research on that, and then we'll have one team that's going to do research on another painting where one of the ladies is wearing a cashmere shawl. So everyone's going to get a chance, so kind of keep in mind which one you would be interested in doing, and then let me know um, tomorrow what you guys want to do, or if you want, I could easily assign something to each team as well. Um, do you have any questions on this particular painting? Now, this is the painting that they're really going to get into detail with you tomorrow. What do you think about the painting? What does it make you feel? What do you notice in terms of like color or texture or or just what does what about this painting speaks to you personally? Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Remember how Mara was talking about light as being an important factor when she does photography? One of the things you're going to see as you get a chance to study this painting um, is how important of a role light plays in this painting as well. Because they have the windows and the artist is behind the the area where the light would be entering into the room from and you notice the candle lights that are all around because he wanted to make sure there was perfect lighting on the face to kind of capture the emotions and the expressions of pretty much every single guest so when you are going to actually see the painting at the museum you're actually going to appreciate the fact that you can see each and every guest facial expression on it. And then from that, you obviously will have an idea of what could have possibly been going on during a wedding feast such as this. But yeah, I'm sure it's probably a little bit darker on your end, Karin, but it's such a spectacular painting. Um, and seeing it tomorrow will just be like, wow, this is just amazing. Um, so they will have that chance to do this tomorrow. So don't Worry if you can't see it right now. Aaliyah, what, what size is this painting? I'm sorry? How big, what size is the painting? What time are we, uh, what time are we going to be there? What size? How big? Is oh, how big is the painting itself? So the painting itself, I think, is a, um, ooh, it's, oof. I want to say almost like a, oh, goodness, maybe 12, 10 feet or something by 6 feet. It's a pretty big painting, but what they did is they actually blew up um, parts of the painting. They have four different pictures or four different um, canvases that they blew up and have those up. So one of them is the facial expression of the bride. One of them is uh, the men that are sitting there and kind of like cheering for the wedding kiss. And then one of them is the actual um, beautiful swan that they have in the photo. Um, so there are four, I think, or three 
probably, I want to say about two, 12 feet by 12, 12 by 12 um, canvases of certain important points within the painting that they have up as well. Does that make sense? Can you hear me, Karin? Yes, I can hear. So that would be great. Yeah, it will. It's 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 spectacular. So when you guys think of the Paisley, remember it's not just limited to Kashmir or Europe or Russia, as as Christian pointed out. It actually was a big part of the early colonial America as well as a fashion statement, and, and it continues to evolve and be present in many facets of fashion and decor even today and perhaps even architecture. So when you guys are working on your shawls or working with your shawls, try to take a look at the, like look into them a little bit more close up and see how you see the Paisley integrated pretty much in every single piece of shawl that you have. Remember how we talked about the smaller bud-like shaped um, flowers, which kind of, are the paisleys themselves if you see here and then within that they'll have the floral designs as well so that's a very common thing you have a paisley but then it's de uh, decorated with other flowers within it and around it as well okay i think that um christian did you have anything else you wanted to add on the on the paisley Oh, no, well, one little funny bit, um, because the shawls originated, like this, pa this pattern originated in Persia originally, um, people in Europe called, and the pattern looks sort of like a pickle, kind of, um, people called them Persian pickles, like the pattern, I thought was kind of funny. Oh, Persian pickles, uh, okay. <laughs> that was it, that was it. Thank you for listening, everyone. Thanks, Christian. Um, all right, girls, do you guys have any questions? Oh my gosh, I'm surprised you don't have any questions. Can I quiz you? Oh my gosh, okay, all right. So what's the most interesting Paisley pattern that you've seen on anything? Do you mean in the things we've seen today or ever? Ever, like anywhere. I know we talked about Alexander McQueen on, on Monday and like his Paisley design with a skull. So what have you seen in today's fashion world or decor or architecture where the Paisley plays a role in it? Vera Bradley. Vera Bradley. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, Vera Bradley uses a lot of the Paisley. Now, here's another question on the Paisley. Do you think it is it would be a feminine pattern, or do you think it's one of those patterns that's almost become universal, even though it's almost like a feminine pattern? You know, when I was a kid, I was... Wait, I can't hear you. I, I, I hear something, but I don't hear. Clearly. Yeah. So I always thought they were kind of a man pattern. And then, you know, Lily Pulitzer started pulling them out. And I think it really depends on the color and what you do with them. Yeah, exactly. And and I think one of the other famous ways of looking at paisleys for men, I think would be like the really upscale, like here's an example of the silk scarves um, that they would wear around their necks. And those would have more of a paisley pattern to it than just checkered or, or um, plain scarf. But they add that to kind of give it that character as well. What do you think about that? <laughs> what? 
What did you say? They're giggling. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel about guys wearing a paisley dress? Oh, not a dress, but like a paisley shirt or something. <laughs> like here's one like look at this whole outfit it's like paislified or what and and even the design or the pattern if you look at it closely um it's kind of from the 1800s especially the colors that they've chosen and the 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 actual paisley um design that they did it's if you look back at remember the shawls we were looking at especially the book that you have you'll notice these long stretched out paisleys and you kind of see that on his shirt here and even on his pants so do you find it interesting that it's still kind of almost like a um unisex pattern that's used um, with the paisley because remember we talked about how the shawls originally started as something that only men wore. Why, why, Aaliyah, why was it that only men wore the shawls? Was it part of their, did, I mean, weren't women cold? Uh, yeah, definitely women were cold, but think about men as also the ones that would go out to war, and they're the ones that are out in this whole area of trying to, um, you know, conquer and stuff like that, and they're the ones that are the first ones to really even have access to such luxuries. Um, that kind of part of it is because they're the first ones to actually get a hold of it and they were the ones that were mostly out and about women were mostly at home and um not necessarily in in, in an area where it required perhaps so much covering because they were more focused on just the dress aspect of it I'm trying to find a photo of napoleon Like, here's a famous photo of Napoleon, which I don't know if you could see it or not, but he's wearing, like, he's got the shawl around his waist here and, and can't zoom in. But maybe I could zoom into this. Look at this. You see how he's got the shawl wrapped around his waist? So what I find interesting is uh, they, they mostly have these shawls that were wrapped around the waist first, almost like a belt, but perhaps it could also be because most of these guys were military and they were trying to protect themselves as well, perhaps from, I don't know, some kind of weapons and, and swords or, or arrows or whatever they would have to be facing. So that would be part of it as well. Um, but I'm sure not Perhaps not the men that were on the front lines were not the ones wearing the fancy shawls. It was probably only the generals and the ones with the status, once again, that would be wearing those as well. But the Mughals, if you go back and you study the emperors, uh, the kings of the, the Mughal Empire, um, which is part of like the whole per Persia region into um, India and then Kashmir, that that's also where the shawls started is because that's what the kings wore and they wore jewels and they wore gems and everything um, because it was considered to be showing your wealth by having the most beautiful gems as well as fiber that you can wear. So that that's kind of part of it. And then the other aspect of it is um, the remember how we talked about the shawls being really really big early on like the size itself was huge because originally they were made for men and if you look what at napoleon here he's got this huge shawl wrapped around himself um which is obviously way too big even on him but women wearing that it would just be a whole bed sheet or something so that was part of the reason why they were able to then come up with other ways of using those 
as well. But it's interesting because I think one of the things we'll end up doing is doing a little bit more detailed um, review into why the men were first interested in these shawls before the women were just all over them. But why do you think that would have been the case, girls? Why do you think the men would be interested in the shawls before the women were? True. Yeah, it was a way for them to show their wealth. Absolutely. Lily said the men were outside more, and the women were inside the home. Yes, that's true as well. So here's a photo of a a painting of Captain John Foot from 1761, and you notice that he's got that turban around his head and then he's got a shawl which is draped over him and then he has the belt which is a shawl also draped around him and then he's wearing this thing that looks like a dress yeah so he was a wealthy captain in the military that was stationed in India um, during the uh, British India Company rule and slowly taking over India. Um, so one of the things they started doing was bringing in artists from Europe to actually capture these moments such as this because they didn't have cameras back then. They only had painters. So they would actually bring in painters from Europe to paint the English or the French or any of the European men in the traditional costumes of the Mughal kings. And this is something similar to what a king would wear um, during the Mughal Empire, except the king would also have tons of pearls and rubies and gems and all sorts of kinds of stuff with them. And one of the, the, the there's a diamond called the Ko Kohenur, which was, the most valued diamond in the entire world was once owned um, by the, the Mughal Empire. And um, they were extremely wealthy for their time. And that was one of the reasons why the British went to India and started conquering and um, pretty much taking everything from that side of the world as well um, and bringing it back. And I think that that diamond is actually in a museum, I want to say, in in England now. So it's it's pretty interesting to say even back then they said that it could feed the entire world for I don't know some ridiculous number of days or years I can't remember anymore but it was it was it had that much value as diamond. But once again a lot of this has to do with showing your status and your wealth. So it was the men that had more of that masculine masculine status and I've got this um, in terms of wealth so I could buy and wear these most expensive shawls or jewels um, that normally now we, we see women wearing. Aaliyah, I just, I, I'm an anglophile. The Koh-i-Noor diamond, I believe, is in the state crown. Where is it now? In the state crown, the, um, the main crown that Elizabeth wears. Really? Huh. Yeah, they stole it from the Mughals. And now they display it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know it was it was in her it was in her possession. It like literally like as a gem in her crown. That I did I wasn't aware of. But I thought it was in a museum. So it basically means the mountain of light um, in terms of the the meaning for it. But the, I'll look into that. That's pretty interesting because I thought the last time I looked it up, I didn't realize it was in her it was in her crown. Hmm. Fascinating. Um, anything else you guys want to add or add any questions that you have about your presentation for for Friday?
Uh, I want to show you one last thing. So on our website, we have under art history, it says Parisian fashion. So if you wanted to kind of go through these photos, um, when you guys are thinking about doing your photo shoot as well, and kind of see how the women use the shawls in their fashion shoot pretty much, um, which was hand sketched back then, but they all have the cashmere shawl in it as a primary, most important accessory. Maybe it'll give you some ideas of how you want to display your final project with the shawls as well. Okay, any other questions? Okay, all right, well, very good. I will see you girls tomorrow and Karin. Um, do you think you'll be able to make it by to, like maybe even 1.45 or 2 o'clock? Yeah, we're going to leave here at um, between 12 and 1, uh, 12 and 12.30. Oh, perfect. It might be a little early, I hope, but I just want extra time in case I do get kind of lost. Yeah. Okay, yeah, because I'm sure it'll take you guys at least an hour, maybe an hour and 15 minutes to get there. Yeah. I don't think there'll be much traffic, though, and... Um, we're actually people going on uh, trips and things like that. We're down to seven plus me. Um, some people have basketball games and other things. So sadly, we have Thursdays to come. Oh, some seven of the girls will be able to come. It'll be seven girls and me. Okay. Well, with the girls, at least are all of them at least within groups, teams one, two, and three? Um, I don't know. We'll have to, you know what we'll do? We'll figure it out and we'll send you an email letting you know. Okay. That sounds good. Sounds like a plan. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Have a very good afternoon. Um, Christian, thank you so much for your presentation. I thought that was great. Very, very educational and helpful. You're welcome. Thanks for having me.